so it's wonderful to see such a great crowd. I appreciate everyone coming. We had a, a great morning session. And, and if you if you happen to miss it, we have already, I think Jenny, we put it up on the website, correct? Okay. So this morning yeah. sessions are already on the website. Oh. What's that? It is on YouTube, YouTube, right? Yeah, on YouTube. And it's it, we'll link it to our website too. So if you have a chance to check it out, I think we had some great, some really great conversations about a lot of topics. We started hinting about economics. We talked about blue carbon economics a little bit this morning, which I think is a new concept for a lot of people. Um, but but I think it's really it's so valuable to have these conversations, right? Things that, you know, you live in your world and you only know what you know. And all of a sudden somebody sparks your brain you're like, wow, that sounds interesting. And all of a sudden it becomes really relevant to bald head and it becomes relevant to the other conversations you need to have with the people around you. And so what I hope that we do here as well as afterwards is have those conversations okay don't be afraid to have a conversation with somebody based on what we learned during the symposium I mean that's kind of the purpose right not to just encapsulate and go home and say oh, that was interesting let's, let's share right let's continue those conversations and again I'd like to thank uh the Johnstons for for providing the fuel for all of this it's been absolutely <laughs> They're, they're so humble, but they're so wonderful to have treasures of the island. So we appreciate you all very much. And thanks to the club for, for agreeing to host this. We've, we've done a, a few of these uh, dinner lectures at the clubs in the past, and they're always so well attended. It's really fun for us. Um, so last but not least uh, on our, our schedule for, for the symposium is Dr. Craig Landry from the University of Georgia. And he's probably going to speak a language in terms of economics that more folks have here than physics, I would assume. It's probably uh, reasonable to assume. Uh, so, so Greg got his um, undergrad at UGA in environmental economics and management. And, or, yes, that's right. In, environment, and then his PhD is from the University of Maryland in essentially in resource economics. But he's done a lot of work and topics for his, his graduate work was coastal erosion. So he did a lot of really important preliminary work in this field. Um, he's, he was at ECU for 10 years, and now he's back in Athens, Georgia, uh, for the last 10 years, which is a wonderful place, as somebody had lived there for a little while, too. Um, and he's in the uh, Agriculture and Applied Economics um, department there. So uh, really cool stuff. I'm really excited to, to hear what Craig has to, to chat about tonight. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Craig. Thank you very much. Thanks, Craig. <laughs> That thing was for this one. Okay. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here and thanks for having me. Nice that people showed up. I <laughs> really appreciate it. Um, and thanks to Dick and Pat for, for putting my family up for a couple of days. It's been really nice. Um, the kids had a great time. Um, so I'm going to talk about the economics of barrier island habitation, the title. Uh, is one that Chris asked me for before I'd written the slides, you know, and under duress, this is what I came up with. Um, to make it a little more saucy, I'll call it cohabitating with nature, storms, and sea level rise. <laughs> Part of what you have to do on the coast is, you know, live with nature, and it's not always easy, as we know, living with people is not always easy. Um, so here's a quick outline, and let me say it at the uh, start that in economics, we usually allow people to talk here in the middle and I'm happy if anybody has questions. Sometimes it's some economics departments are notorious where someone will start you know attacking the speaker and they, they never can finish their talk. <laughs> so let's not do that. <laughs> but if you have questions, feel free to interrupt. You know, just raise your hand. Um, so what I'm going to do is define what I think is most pertinent for the coastal economy. Uh, and then those elements are going to have to do with tourism. Uh, property markets, which I'll, I'll talk more about than probably anything else. There's some interesting recent papers on maladaptation, which is a term I, I was not familiar with, but it's adapting in the wrong way where you're making things worse. So I'll show you some of those. And I've managed to put in a lot of figures. This was a uh, graduate class. I probably have a lot of equations on the slides. I'm not going to show you a lot of equations. We're going to stick with a lot of pictures, which are really is the way to go. And the last thing I want to talk about is work that I'm doing with uh, Dylan McNamara, who talked this morning, and some folks at Duke and Ohio State, where we're trying to model the coupled human natural system. It's really complicated, but we have something we've come up with that we think shows how the coast might evolve over the next 100, 150 years. Um, 
So I'll, I'll finish with that. And again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to, to chime in. You may recall from school, when you were told about the economy, what the economy is, we have this circular flow diagram where you have households who have you know, resources and firms that produce things, and there's a government that kind of mediates that interaction. Um, that's what most economists work on. When I teach a class, usually this is my point of departure where I show that that economy is set in a, an environment that draws resources from the environment and then spits out things like you know, water pollution, trash, and we need to think about how the economy is dependent upon the resource base. So usually this is my point of departure and I spend all my time on the periphery of this graph. But given that we're on Bald Head Island, we can actually drill down more to what is the coastal economy all about. And first I'll recognize that historically the coastal economy is about defense, logistics, and fisheries, right? That's, that's really is an important, important industries for the coast. If that was all that was going on on the coast, we probably wouldn't have a lot of the issues that we have. So I'm going to focus on elements of the coast that are pertinent to Bald Head and, and other places. Um, and really, the, the center point here is these, these coastal ecosystems, like your maritime forest and the awesome bird populations that you have, that create you know value. People want to be here because of the the environmental resources. And then around that, you know, we've got some local government that's trying to make uh, decisions and manage the resources, they're getting some taxes. The primary uh, focus of my talk will be on property markets and, and tourism. Um, if I had more time, I would talk a bit more about land use and infrastructure, but I don't want to take up more than an hour. So I'm really going to focus on property markets and tourism. What's really important to how the coast and the economy become coupled is the fact that there's all these great natural resources on the coast. Um, this morning, we heard a lot about sediments. We heard about water. We heard about, heard about marshes. These are you know, critically important to uh, the sustainability of the system and the reason people want to be here. Right? If those things are gone, there's really no reason to be here. So we want to make sure we come up with ways to habitate and cohabitate that respects these systems and tries to coexist in ways that are, are beneficial for them, but also for us. Um, so first I'll talk about tourism. I have a few papers that I've worked on that I like to highlight. I think they might be interesting. Um, I'm also prepared to skip some slides if you look bored. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll be reading the lab. Um, so typically if you're talking about the tourist economy, this is the slide where you say, yeah, people like the environment on the coast. The areas provide for recreation and leisure. There's statistics about coastal visitation. Mine are kind of old. Um, and a lot of people just focus on jobs, tax revenue, and value added. That's kind of what you think of the economy is doing in the circular flow of the economy. I'm going to take a slightly different uh, tack because I'm interested in how the resource base creates value. So I want to focus on net value, uh, which is not how you're probably accustomed to thinking about the economy or tourism. Demand. Let me explain what I mean. Um, so there's an approach that we use to look at uh, recreation or tourism. We call it the travel cost model. And in this framework, we think about trips as being something you produce yourself. So it's not something you go and buy, typically. It's something that you produce. You have knowledge about where you can go uh, on the coast. You use your car. You use your groceries. You go to that place, and you create the experience yourself. And so there's inputs that are yours, and there are inputs that you purchase uh, in the market. The key to this model is using travel costs. So it's both money costs and time costs that you invest to go to a place and get the experience. Treat that as a price. That's the price of a, of a tourism visit. Once we do that, once we have that um, assumption or that structure, we can start to look at trade-offs. So how do people trade off distance with quantity? And I've estimated a lot of these models and you always find a beautiful downward sloping demand curve, which is exactly what you expect. But also we can look at site quality. What kind of amenities will drive somebody to a place like Bald Head where you know it's harder to get to? You've got to wait on the ferry. You know, maybe you don't get on the first ferry, so the access itself is more problematic and uncertain. Um, so uh, typically, to estimate these models, this is a, a project that I did for North Carolina Sea Grant when I was at East Carolina. And we collected the data from uh, I think a thousand residents in North Carolina. And the idea behind the travel cost model is that as you're deciding where you want to visit, you're looking at the cost of getting there. I put my star in Greenville, where I used to live, and it's purple. So has to be purple. Um, and as you look at the trade-offs, it's you know how much how accessible is this place? And then once you get there, 
What's it like? What's the experience like? How good are the amenities? I mean, they could be commercial amenities, they could be environmental amenities. Um, you might recall Kitty Hawk has some narrow beaches if you've been up there recently, whereas other places have wide beaches. So that's one of the things that we think drive demand. It's, it's the experience and the quality of the environment when you get there. So the travel cost model um, is basically looking at travel as a, as a um, monetary cost, but also a time cost, which varies across people, uh, and, and how you trade that off for the number of trips. And with the data, uh, you can estimate a demand curve, which you might recall from school, and how often you see demand curves. But basically, there's a trade-off between trips and cost. And if we can identify that relationship, we can calculate the value of the experience, which we call consumer surplus. Uh, it goes by some other names. But what this is, it's the measure of net value over and above what you pay that you get from the experience. And that's really what the economy is about, is providing things that we value. Um, measures like GDP are quantity times price, which would be this rectangle, um, which really doesn't tell us if it's creating value for people or not. So we're trying to measure what is the net value of an experience like going to uh, the beach. To give you an example of what, what kind of magnitudes uh, we're talking about, this is a, a project that I did with some colleagues in East Carolina when I was down there. One of my first papers that I wrote when I was a young assistant professor was in really trying to, to get on the horse and produce as much research as I could. Um, the data were collected for, by recreation uh, researchers, and they weren't really thinking about doing this travel cost approach, but we, uh, a colleague and I, were able to use the data to do a demand model estimation. And I'll focus on the, the sites that maybe are more relevant. Uh, you're familiar with Wrightsville, Hatteras, Hopsdale. These are estimates of the net uh, economic value per person per day. And it would be really hard for you to, to gauge what, that, what those values would be. These often feed into uh, some of the results or some of the analysis the Corps of Engineers does when they're looking at um, nourishing a beach. They want to know if we add to the beach, or let's say we preserve the beach, what kind of recreation are we, uh, are we preserving? So they'll use these numbers in some of their cost-benefit analysis as measures of value. And you can see they vary across what is the value of a day trip and that of what you pay in an overnight trip. So that's just meant to give you a little flavor of what are the net values. And these are kind of old because they're... Uh, almost 20 years old now. Um, so they probably, if you're going to inflate them these days, they would be really high. Um, that's a kind of a crude measure, though, because it's what we call a, a representative agent model, where there's not a lot of heterogeneity. You know, there's just a value that occurs to people, that accrues to people, and those people are kind of amorphous and homogenous. What could be more useful is to look at um, specific sites and how the, that value, that value that you get from going to a site, varies with attributes of the site. So imagine that um, most microeconomic behavior is based on this thing called utility, which we can't measure, but we assume it drives behavior. You're seeking out satisfaction in your decisions. And if you're looking at a site, the distance is going to be a cost, right? If it's far, it's going to be a lot more of an expense to get there. Once I get there, what's the water quality like? What's the scenic, what are the scenic amenities like? So imagine that we could just uh, aggregate those into a utility score. <clears throat> which is overall how, how desirable is that destination? And again, this is fairly useful from a marketing perspective if you're thinking about wanting to draw certain kinds of you know, consumers or visitors to a place like Baldo. What drives um, sorting across space is arguably those utilities that people perceive when they make decisions. So again, this is from that same Sea Grant project that I did um, when I was at ECU. And I couldn't quite do this figure exactly the way I wanted it, but, um, the highest visitation sites here, Wrightsville, Carolina, Caswell, Ocean Isle, Emerald, Nags Head. Maybe not surprising, probably because they're, they're very accessible. Some of the ones that are less accessible would be like Bald Head in blue here, uh, figure eight, really small. So basically we're seeing how people sort across space and that sorting is presumably a function of what it costs to get somewhere and what's the benefit once you get there. Um, so something I started to work on with one of my former graduate graduate students is to take those utility scores and decompose them into characteristics. And if we know the characteristics that drive visitation, it tells us something about the value. And from a marketing perspective or an investment perspective, you know, HAB is harmful algorithms. Um, my former student who's now at Everglades Foundation, they're really worried about harmful algorithms and how it affects tourism in uh, Florida. Um, he's going to help fund this research. 
Um, and I didn't have maritime forest reverting in here until we got to Baltan. And I said, I have to add those now because those, those are really the site attributes that I see as being extremely attractive uh, here. So once we look at that sorting and we can decompose these um, scores, we can actually value what is, what's the change in the net value that you get for visiting for one change in that resource. So for example, if we added a hectare of maritime forest, what's the additional value that, that somebody would get for that? Again, that gives you a basis to do some investment decisions on preservation or restoration. The last thing I'd like to focus on for tourism, uh, I am not timing myself. We can just, it. No, we're good. I mean, if we get long, just, just no, we need I, I've got a lot more. Yeah. 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 Good, good. I'm saying I'm not timing myself. So, yeah. so. Yeah. Okay, so one of the one of the critical attributes is beach width. And what's interesting about beach width, I'll show you later from some of the work I did on my dissertation, is it's something we can control. You know, we, we do it periodically to, to protect and also to provide recreation and amenities. For this project, um, not only looking at where people went, but also asking them if they would support state programs to do nourishment across the coastline and offering them different costs and saying, would you support a referendum that, that does this? So that data combined with their actual visitation and using the variation of beach width uh, gives us an estimate of a meter of beach width. And I don't think anybody's quite had this for visitors. So from our estimates, and it also includes what we call non-use value. Even if you don't go to the beach, you might care that it's there for turtles or for you know, other organisms or even other people. Um, so there's a, an estimate, um, I think it's the first in the literature of what is the value of beach width for visitors. The other thing we were able to do was to look at how people value different approaches to erosion management, which I'm sure you're all concerned about. Um, so we're able to back out some uh, willingness to pay per household per year. And this is for the entire state of North Carolina. So we get an estimate of $37, which is, you know, kind of substantial for people that live in the western part of the state if they're actually willing to pay something to support coastal management. For beach home homeowners, uh, we get a much larger uh, uh, magnitude estimate, not surprising. When we offer uh, shoreline armory as an option, people didn't like that. Um, and that's just for the entire state. So it's not just people on the coast, but also people you know in the western part of the state. So much lower ones to pay essentially zero for a shoreline armory, which is a, a pretty strong indicator that people don't like that approach. And when we offered shoreline retreat, a lot of people like that. I think because they feel like they're not fighting, we're not fighting nature, we're you know adapting to nature. Um, so we do see really high willingness to pay for shoreline retreat. Can I ask what year this data was collected? Because it's 2020 on the publication, but I'm assuming it's 20. Yeah, the data were probably 2015. Okay. 2014. Maybe 2013. <laughs> it's all a blur, but yeah, something like that. I was just kind of wondering about the inflation time, like if they would, what those numbers would be today. Right. Um, yeah, so if we were going to do some policy analysis, you could take them and inflate yeah. them as, as necessary. Um, it took me a while to get this model estimated, which is why it took five years to get published. It was a fairly complicated statistical exercise. It seems like it. <laughs> Thank you. Shoreline retreat is moving houses. Yeah, so retreat would be, um, so this is South Nags Head, which has a huge erosion problem. So this is the photo was taken down there. Uh, yeah, so we asked people, should we just move things back? Should we invest in sand or should we invest in moving? Mm -hmm. 193, what's household. household. Yeah, household for household period. But what about North Oxford? I mean, that is I mean, really, really, they have a really bad. Highly wasted. Yeah, I've never been there, but I've heard stories. I've been there and seen uh, houses that were ocean, that were oceanfront, that the water was already up to the yeah. house. Yeah. In the house I was in, the waves were coming in. So it was <laughs> frightening. Yeah. Um, so a lot of these houses were condemned yeah. because their septic tanks were in the surf zone. Yeah. And, and the, a lot of the owners lived in places like New Jersey, New York, and they were getting orders to, to tear down their house, you know, because it was on public property and there was a legal battle that ensued, but those houses aren't there. So the idea is if we're going to be organized about retreat, don't let it get to this point. Because I mean, who wants to go to that beach, you know, nobody. Um, so it does seem like people like the idea of adapting and going with nature. Yes. Quick question. So, so I understand, willingness to pay is based on yeah. asking people. 
Um, they're observing their actual behaviors. It's both. It can be both. Yeah, it can be both. So for this estimate, it's both. These are what we call stated preference, which is is what people say. And you're right to be a little skeptical. Um, there's been research on how to do that well, um, and there's certain prompts you can you can give to people that makes their um, the way they treat the question a lot more realistic. And a lot of time when this research is done, people don't don't do that. So this can be done really poorly. I like to think mine is done well. <laughs> I've done some experiments in labs to to see how people respond to different kinds of um, hypothetical questions, and there are primers that you can use to kind of make them treat it as if it's a realistic. But that is that is one of the biggest criticisms of, of this particular approach. So good, good question. Okay, so that's all I have to say about tourism. Um, the next set of models I want to show you have to do with property prices, which we're all kind of obsessed with yeah. at the age of zero. Um, and and these, this class of models is known as hedonic, and the uh, root is there is, is hedonism in that we'll pay for stuff we like and we don't want to pay for stuff we don't like, like flood risk. Um, and these models are really cool because they make intuitive sense and you can learn a lot from looking at property values. So the motivation for this, if you think about your standard supply and demand graph, that really assumes that the good that's being traded is homogenous. So it's like a bushel of wheat. You know, they're all the same. Once you look at a, a heterogeneous good, the price is going to vary with the quality of the good. So no longer are we talking about a single price. What we want to do is identify a hyperplane or a multidimensional plane that tells us how price adjusts with with attributes. Um, and this is called the hedonic price function. Um, this has been going on since the 1960s uh, in economics. And the idea underlying it is to decompose. So take a price, pull it apart, analyze, and also predict. You can use the predictive model too. Um, there was a guy at Harvard in the early 70s who showed if you can estimate this, you can actually know something about this willingness to pay that we, that we keep talking about. And this would be from actual market data, not from what somebody says. Two guys use this basic idea and form Zillow, and this is essentially what they do. They just create these algorithms that try to get the best prediction on price that they possibly can. That's not what we do because we're actually interested in uh, analyzing and analyzing what what things influence price, whereas they're just trying to get the tightest prediction they can. But it's the same fundamental idea. So when you look at coastal home values. Proximity to downtown or the central business district always pops up as being important, not surprising. Um, water frontage and proximity, also highly valued. Flood zone status, sometimes. <laughs> because amenities and risk can be really highly correlated, right? It's almost this, a point in space can have great amenity and also terrible risk. Um, uh, this is a little story of a, a series of papers I developed that were designed to deal with this, this problem of correlation of risk and amenities. So this goes back to my days at East Carolina. I had two colleagues who were looking at Carteret County, and they said, this is so weird. We keep looking in the special flood hazard area, which is this 100-year flood zone, and everything's selling at a premium there. It's like, this is where you don't want to be. It's like, well, but look how nice it is, you know, and maybe this picture's not fair here, but, um, you know, even these houses back there that are still in that high flood risk zone are selling at a premium. So we decided, well, let's look at the mainland of Carteret and see what happens. And, and sure enough, we found if you're in a flood zone, your house is discounted, and that discount is consistent with flood insurance costs. So the question is, what's going on here? How do we disentangle these two things? And we had a long talk about how to do it, and uh, we had a, a geographer on the team, and he said, well, let's try to measure view shed, which is maybe a term you've heard, maybe not. Um, so this is the first paper that I know of that actually was able to do this. So um, and again, this is um, looking at New Hanover. Um, so we get LIDAR data, topological data for the entire coastline and it's year specific. So if there's a dune here and I can't see the ocean, I know that dune's there. If the dune's not there next year, I know that. If there's trees, you know, so basically I can see, I can see all of the natural environment and I can plot the person down on what is, you know, the first or second story of a house and calculate what they can see. So for two houses like parcel one and parcel two, I can actually calculate, you know, the, the you know the area or the degrees of view that that's accessible to the place. And what was really nice about this is that measure of amenity was not correlated with flood risk. So there's some people who are far back and they're not in the flood zone and they still have a view. So um, we calculate an ocean uh, degree is worth about a thousand dollars, and once you include that in your statistical model, 
you get the result that you expect that flood risk does increase property values. So it's kind of a cool paper. I thought it was a really cool idea. It's nice that it came together so cleanly. <clears throat> um, so when you look at um, housing values and flood risk, there's some stylized facts. Um, typically, when you pu 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 uh, publish new flood risk maps or put information out about flood risk, it will exacerbate price differentials. People will become you know, hyper aware that this is in a, in a risk zone where this other house is not. Oftentimes when we see the floods occur, it really pronounces that effect that the discounts will be large, um, but a lot of times they'll diminish and disappear, which is fascinating because you know people are really unpredictable and sometimes we have really short memories. <laughs> um, so this is a paper uh, I did kind of on my way out the door at ECU, but the idea here is to try to understand what's driving that and, and how big is this effect. So we focused on Pitt County where we lived and we were interested in uh, Floyd, which I know affected Bald Head as well, and Fran, because before Fran, there were really no major hurricanes that hit Pitt County. So we have people in the flood zone and people out of the flood zone that had not been flooded and probably weren't thinking about floods. And then we have an event, and then we have a school event. We have a nice spread of housing sales data across those events. So this approach, which is known as difference and difference, which will become clear in a minute, is to say, okay, what are these events doing for this treatment group? For people in the flood zone, they get hit, they get hit again. They're probably, you know, updating their beliefs and saying, wow, uh, maybe things are changing, or maybe we misunderstood the risk that we were facing. Whereas okay. people outside of the flood zone, if there's a new hospital, you know, built, it's going to affect the labor market and it's going to affect property prices in general. So it should affect both of these. So what I want to do is look at the differences pre and post, but then compare them to the differences in the other group to try to pick out what's really due to the flooding event. So the reason it's called difference and difference is I'm gonna take this difference and subtract this difference. And that should tell me what the actual impact is of uh, Floyd or, or Fran. So we were able to do that. And what we find, yeah, please. Could you um, put in there the exact time? Um, Did I include what? Time. That's about what I'm that's what I'm about to show you. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so how long did it take? Could be the question we asked. How long does it take? So we have this event, we get these really big discounts for the flood zone, 6%, 11%, 20%. And then let's march ahead in time and we see 21 to 32 months. So not even three years after um, a pretty devastating hurricane in Pitt County, there's no longer a discount for being in flood zone. We appeal to what's called the availability heuristic, which is from psychology, that people have a hard time envisioning uh, bad events. We don't want to remember that stuff. And the, the further it fades into our mind, we're happy to forget it. I like to use the example of middle school. Middle school staff. So when you think back, it's all right. It's fine. I have a question. Yeah. I know there were property buyouts right after this. Like in, in, in a pit? Yeah. So like, how do you think that might have impacted that memory is if people weren't buying the properties that were bought out? Yeah, like I'm thinking true. right there in Uptown, right? Like you have yeah. the whole stretch. Of yeah. Park. Yeah, that's right. There were there. That was the biggest buyout that happened after Floyd. Yeah. So that's that? potentially confounding. If if there was a big decrease in flood risk, but it wouldn't have impacted them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there were still lots of houses in the flood zone that still had a discount that disappeared. Um, okay. Uh, the last thing I want to I think is the last thing I want to talk about housing prices is beach width again important for coastal communities and important for the kinds of analysis that I want to do when I'm trying to understand, you know, when do you nourish, how much do you nourish, and, and when do you give up? So a recent paper uh, looking at Dare County and trying to understand uh, what is the proximity to the, to the beach where that beach really matters versus if you're way, way far back from the coast, it just kind of the beach in general matters. But if you're on the beachfront, it's that beach, right? That's the one that protects you. That's the one that when you walk out to have coffee or you know go throw the football with your kids, that's your beach. So we know there's this, this capitalization that happens due to proximity. Uh, so we looked at different specifications to try to understand that. And for Dare County, what we found was 
1,000 to 2,000 feet is really where the action is. And this is useful from a financing perspective. These are the guys who are, you know, the households that are benefit. I'm sorry if you're one of those households, but it's true. You're getting the benefits of the, of the beach width and you probably should pay more if it's going to be financed locally. Um, one thing we're able to tease out is again, a marginal value of loans to pay. So what's the value of additional beach, uh, additional uh, foot of beach width? Similar to what we got in the tourism market. Here we're looking at uh, residents and trying to understand what's it worth. And when you get a really high value, this is for somebody who's right on the beachfront. Like it's really important for them to have additional beach width. Um, check how I'm doing on time. Let's see. This, this, this good. particular, good. okay, I'll, I'll say something quick about this. Um, how do we get to these resources? How do we get to these public trust resources? Um, access. I, it's probably an issue here. You know, you may be really close to the beach, but the access point may be way down there and you can't go over the dunes. So um, again, working with a former student, we thought, let's look at this. Um, he's in Florida, so we're gonna look at Pinellas County, which is Tampa Bay area. And the idea here was oftentimes when we look at housing values, we think about proximity. Proximity, you know, it does give you views, it gives you ocean breeze, um, but access is more complicated because again, it depends upon the infrastructure network that provides access. So for this guy, you know, he's not that far, but if he has to go all the way around, that probably affects the property value. So that was our idea to try to understand how to access networks influence value. And the other thing we thought would be interesting, these houses have to deal with all of this traffic. Not really a problem here, but if you've been to other parts of the coast, if you're near an access point, it may not be very desirable. So we were curious to see what does that do to some of these property values? There's a symbol for that. <laughs> so what we find, uh, as I was writing these up, it occurred to me, these are actually very small, um, which kind of is one of the reasons I didn't know if I wanted to do it more and talk about it. Um, being closer to the coast does have an impact on property value. The average home in Pinellas is about a half a million to put things in, in perspective. So moving a little bit closer has a big impact. Being closer to an access point is pretty small, um, about one four percent And I don't know why that is. I would actually expect it to be more. Um, assuming that you actually use the beach and you just don't like living at the beach. Um, it could be that when you buy, you don't realize where the access point is, but I kind of find that hard to believe. Um, so again, surprisingly small. Uh, for being near an access point, we call this an externality. There's people who are enjoying the beach and they're kind of imposing upon my enjoyment of my house. Um, again, these are fairly small, but you know, $2,000 discount if you're, if you're uh, close to an access point with 50 parking spots. Maybe not surprising. Okay, so maladaptation. There's been a bunch of literature on what are we doing wrong uh, and how bad is it? Um, that's, I think that's where Dan, I recall. It looks like somebody's trying to hold the house back. <laughs> One thing we see is we know hazards are increasing. Coastal real estate values are increasing too. Um, this is just looking at counties, so it's very crude. But you can see there's this premium for being on the coast. And if we actually drill down to like zip codes or, or census blocks, we'd see an even bigger difference. So it does follow trends. You know, we have a recession here, which causes a correction in housing values. But um, there is this premium for being on the coast. Um, there's a recent paper that suggests prices on the coast are 13% above what you would expect just based on an asset that's exposed to flood risk. So the question is why? Does anybody have any ideas? Probably the amenities. Gratification. gratification. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? It's beautiful. It, okay, it's the amenities, yeah, sure. Other ideas? Yeah. Different people with different preferences. That don't care as much about flood risk? Yeah. Different places are different. Yeah. I, I think it could be. It could be. Yeah. It's been 31 months since the last uh, flood. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think income inequality is one of the driving forces. Um, there's a paper that looks at the, the rate of growth and returns on investment on capital, like housing versus wages. And, you know, we've seen, so this graph shows you. The earnings of the bottom 50 and the top one from 1980 to 2015. And that's a pretty drastic change. Um, so we have a model that I'll show you uh, 
towards the end of the talk where we have this as part of the dynamics that are driving. I think that's a big part of it, but it's, it is gratification. And maybe I have a lot of money and I'm not too worried about losing my house. Um, those, those could be some of the issues. So um, even, even if we have downward pressure because of sea level rising storms, if we have this wealth accumulation, and again, it's a competitive market, right? People are bidding up properties. Oh, look at that, the whale house, it's beautiful. You know, I wanna be there. Um, so that's enough to, to, to potentially overwhelm uh, risk discounts. So let's talk more about maladaptation. Um, this is not great um, evidence, but it's still kind of interesting. So typically when you get a storm, there is a desire to big, build back bigger, which oftentimes you would hope means safer, but oftentimes it means more extravagant and luxurious. And if there were uh, people of more modest means who were there previously, a lot of times they are pushed out because what's rebuilt is stuff they can't afford to live in. Um, oftentimes when you put in things like seawalls or flood protection, it creates this false sense of security where people say, oh, okay, it's fine. And as we saw earlier in the talks earlier, those are really good at controlling the small disturbances, but the big ones, they might make even worse, which is something a lot of people don't understand. Um, this graphic shows the size of houses in Florida, whether they're in a nourished zone or not a nourished zone. Uh, so Florida has a lot of beach nourishment and we're basically sorting them. So what's the biggest house in Florida in a nourished zone on average versus not? You can see there's a lot more capital investment in zones that are being nourished. There's just more stuff there. Now it could be because the houses are there, the Corps of Engineers is doing their, their storm mm -hmm. reduction benefits and they say, oh, we have to protect this area because there's so many houses there. So we have this potential reverse causation where the more the value goes up, the more we have to protect it. And then we keep, you know, we keep doing uh, beach nourishment or mitigation um, but again, a positive feedback loop can't persist indefinitely. A better uh, result uh, was from some colleagues, uh, Dylan was on this paper, who I uh, spoke this morning, where they had a, a much nicer test case. If you're familiar with the history of, of uh, this part of North Carolina, Nags Head got a beach nourishment product, project, Kitty Hawk did not. And they were basically the same town, right? You couldn't really tell when you crossed from Nags Head to Kitty Hawk previously, unless you saw the sign. Once they did the nourishment in Nags Head, the assessed values and the property values are way up compared to Kitty Hawk. And again, it's a nice comparison because we, we before we knew they were roughly the same property market. And as soon as the beach was invested in, the property values all go up. And again, we're on this positive feedback loop where, you know, when's the train gonna stop? Mm -hmm. uh, more evidence. This is really fascinating. I wish I would have written this paper, but I didn't. Um, there's this Yale climate opinion survey that surveys the entire U.S. and asks people about climate change beliefs. And um, these two papers and the next one uh, use some of that data to see how does that influence housing transactions. So they look at places that tend to be a lot more denial oriented <laughs> and places that are more believer oriented and say, what's going on in these two places? This shows you the discount for being underwater at various levels of sea level rise, and it shows you the huge difference in the market. It really depends who's there, who's, who, who are the players. Um, if you're a believer, there's no discount. If you're, a, uh, if there's a discount, if you're a denier, there's a discount, but it's just not very sensitive. So again, we just see this really stark separation based on people's beliefs. Sorry, can you explain that again? Yeah. 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 yeah so there's a discount, <laughs> uh, there's a discount yeah. from being underwater at various levels. When you say underwater. Uh, like in the future. Like, let's say, okay. yeah, um, so I'm using their term. Um, basically, just think of it as, as sea level rise flood risk. Right. So as it increases, we do get price discounts, which you would expect. Um, people that don't believe in, in climate change or, or tend to, you know, kind of poo poo the idea, the, 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 the prices are greater and the discount, the discount is not a steep. That's Miami and South Beach. Um, I don't know enough about those places to say. I know they're doing a lot of stuff on flight. Uh, so I don't you just see some of the interviews. Yeah. They're like, I'll be dead. I don't care. And we hear a lot of that. That's so we, I've done some work with Tybee Island in Georgia, and we hear a lot of that, especially from some of the older council members. You know, and I always say, well, what about your kids? Yeah. Do you know the current company? Likelihood of the sea rise, you know, the areas of the consideration and the rate of rock. Do you want to go to show a house in that area? That's a whole nother talk. 
to give me a, yeah. an hour. But you're right, it's really important. Um, so there's different, there's homeowners, there's flood, there's wind. Um, and there's the sophisticated reinsurance guys, Swiss Re and Zurich Re, who do these really uh, complicated catastrophe models. And there's prices all over the place. It really is a whole nother talk. Um, You're smart enough to use this data. <laughs> I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Our insurance insurers are pulling back and they're starting to say we want service properties anymore. So I'm guessing the people that would buy it are able to afford self insurance. There could be. Um, yeah, so so you only have to have flood insurance if you have a mortgage and it only goes to a quarter million. You don't have to have homeowners insurance unless you choose to. So it does depend upon the pool of buyers. Um, again, there's a bunch of issues on insurance. Um, you have to invite me back next year and I'll talk about it. <laughs> um, another paper that looks at this maladaptation. Um, recognizes these difference in beliefs and how they create uh, differences in, in prices, price schedules, and the risk premium. And what they do is they do a simulation where they say, let's assume the National Flood Ins Insurance Program eventually gets the rates right, which they are trying to do better. They have this new thing they call risk risk rate 2.0. Because yeah. we know the rates were garbage before. So what happens if they start pricing it correctly at some point um, and what they show is the more optimists you have, the bigger distortion you get. But if this can force it, you will get this, this convergence in prices. Um, I think that's doing a decent justice to what they did. Um, but again, the idea is that beliefs, different beliefs can cause, you know, sorting across space and it has really distinct price effects depending upon uh, the people in the market. Let's learn more about Miami. Yeah, uh, the last one I think that I'll talk about, uh, this came out in the Journal of Financial Economics, which is a big hitter journal. Again, they're looking at segmentation by belief and knowledge. They go a little bit deeper to look at the kinds of buyers because they're trying to figure out where, where do these knowledge gaps or knowledge differences come from. And they can tell who's an owner, occupier, who's not, partly because um, there's the homestead exemption. And there's other, like if your tax address is not the house address, they can tell you're an absentee owner. So they call these people sophisticated buyers. I hope that doesn't offend anybody here. <laughs> them, not me. And what they find is if there are these non-owner-occupied houses, they do find that these guys are pricing in the risk. They're looking at sea level rise, flood risk, and they're taking account of it. And when you compare that to markets that are dominated by owner-occupied, you don't see that, which is trouble. Wait, what? So a market that's dominated by outside buyers does show discounts. And I'll let me point out the figure and maybe that'll help. Um, Non-owner occupied, let's look at the discount for being in a flood risk zone. You can see there, so there's error bars here, but you can see there are significant uh, discounts um, for if you're a non-owner occupier. For the people that are owner occupiers, they don't see that. And this is a, this is a national data set, the entire US. I don't understand what that means. So it I says if a market's dominated by owner occupiers, no, not that part. there's no discount for flood risk. Average, uh, maybe it's sea level rise risk would be a better way to describe it. Yeah, let's call it sea level rise risk. And this is averaging over the entire US. So it's hard to kind of like pinpoint what's going on in a particular area. But basically they're saying there's, there's in their mind, two kinds of buyers. The sophisticated buyer is pricing it in and, and other people are not. On a timeline of 07 to 16, which again, maybe, maybe we wouldn't find the same thing if we looked with more recent data. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sophisticated buyers are which group? Uh, it would be the, the non owner occupied. So, somebody who has a dress outside or somebody who's buying it to Airbnb it for basically they're looking at it. Yeah. yeah. So, it could be it could be a second home or it could be an Airbnb. It could be, they don't distinguish between those. Ah, so, they get a bigger discount? They, they require a discount to buy. So, if they buy in the flood zone, they say we're not going to pay as much. Oh, and presumably they're they're more sophisticated than that. They're paying more attention to yeah, yeah. market fundamentals. Yeah. They might. They might. Yeah. They might. Yeah. I respect your opinion. I don't know. I'm telling you what they found. Um, it's not my favorite. Yeah. So do you think it's something like an emotional component of owners that like owners yeah. love that property? Connection to place. They, they want to stay there even longer than maybe they should. Yeah. So. I think that's definitely part of it. 
Yeah, I think place attachment is probably the emotions of place attachment are probably a big part of it. Um, whereas if you're just a, an investor, you know, you're looking at it as an asset. What's the risk? What's the return? When do I get in? When do I get out? So these, those, that, those, those buyers tend to be playing the market and thinking about risk, whereas a lot of people, other people are not. And then when you look at rents, a rent is a flow of value. You know, it has nothing to do with the asset. The rents don't show any discounts at all, right? I don't care if the house is about falling in the ocean from a renter, as long as it doesn't do that while I'm there. <laughs> um, so again, interesting. Again, it's all about market segmentation. Different players in different markets are causing really different phenomena to, mm -hmm. to arise. Mm -hmm. Okay, last topic I have. Hopefully, I'm not going over. Um, this is some of the stuff I've been doing with uh, Dylan and Marty Smith at, at Duke. Um, this goes back to, again, my dissertation. Um, I was one of the first people to, to think about this in a dynamic optimization framework. And then I got clobbered by Dylan and, and Marty because they got everything except grant and they just did everything awesome. And I had to review some of those papers. Oh, it's so good. I was, you know, <laughs> um, but this, my dissertation was looking at managing a beach um, as an asset. And imagine we have a flow. So there's net, net benefits from the quantity. Let's think about that as a width. We have an action. It could be putting up seawalls. Probably it's going to be nourishing. And I'm discounting, you know, just imagine I'm adding up the values over time. And as I nourish, I'm getting some change. Um, I'm building it out. And then there's erosion. And I'm building it out. And it's erosion. I'll show you a figure in a sec. Um, but this framework we're all using now to, to look at uh, coastal adaptation. Um, this is from my dissertation. I looked at Tybee Island because I had data there. And Dylan showed us a slide like that today where this is, this is my management variable. So I go in, I dump a bunch of sand on the beach and then I wait and I dump a bunch more and then I wait and I do it more. And my timelines are pretty wide here. Again, this is almost, it's almost 20 years ago. But what's happening to the beach? It builds up, it erodes, it builds up, it erodes, it builds up, it erodes. Um, so I was happy that they cited my dissertation and some of their early research. But again, they just took it and they just, they ran with it and did some really, really awesome stuff. Um, I'm happy to be a part of some of it, but I wasn't a part of all of it. Um, so um, we're going to use that basic framework to think about what does the future hold. I think that's my name. Right? Yeah, I just found it. I stole it. I'm not even attributing it to work. So one thing we're worried about is sand is becoming scarce. Um, some of the papers that Marty and his grad students have looked at is a race to get the sand. So it's a common pool resource. You know, get it while you can. You have to go further and further offshore. The costs of beach nourishment are going up. Um, this is a more recent figure from a recent paper. If you look at total sand um, relocation, it's been going up, 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 and then starting to tail off, partly because it's really hard to find, which Dylan talked about sea level uh, driving mm -hmm. the, the system. Sand scarcity is going to be a big driver too. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, uh, I want to cite Dylan and some of, the, some of the work that they've done. The idea is to look at sand volume and frequency to try to understand how do you manage this resource, knowing that it's dynamic. You know, when you nourish the beach, it doesn't just stay there. It erodes, and then you can approve it again. So some of the stuff they've done is looking at uh, when would you transition to armory? If you live in a city like Manhattan, or, you know, at some point, you're going to protect that because there's too much value there. But on Barrier Island, it's kind of different. When do we elevate? Uh, when might we, re we retreat or adapt? Um, once we do, if we were to move off an island, we know that they're going to, you know, they're going to be natural again to some extent. We're overwash, we'll move them back, and there'll be deposition in the back barrier, and the, the islands can can kind of move as sea level rises. Um, but again, it's really complex. So the last thing I want to share with you is this model we've been working on. This is the last part of our. We have this joint National Science Foundation uh, project looking at. North Carolina and Maryland. And we've done a bunch of numerical, empirical survey stuff, and we're trying to pull it all together to see what does the future hold, which is why I have the, the Miami slide. And somebody came up with a clever name, Seahome, for it, but it's the Coastal Housing Ownership Model. Um, oh, I have a movie. Which is a movie play. Um, it's an agent-based model. Has anybody ever heard the term agent-based? <laughs> Academics have, yeah. Um, so let me see if this will play. It probably won't. Yeah. Oh, there we go. So this is Lord of the Rings. They had to do complex battle scenes, and they didn't know exactly how to do it. So they basically said, told the computer, we have this many orcs, this many elves. Let them go at it 
and just let it happen. So they had basically decision rules. Do I engage? Do I not engage? You know, well, how do I engage? Um, so this is all computer animated and it's, it's, it's an agent-based model. And what's interesting about these is the parameter values matter. When they initially did this, they had these engage retreat, you know, parameters, a bunch of them just ran away. <laughs> like they decided, yeah, they decided it wasn't worth it. So the orbs, elves, and dwarves are all just fleeing into the woods. Um, and that's not, that's not good. Right? Nobody wants to see that. So again, you have to tweak these to get them to, to work. Um, so it is a lot of, I don't know, it's almost like, it's almost like you can get the model to do anything you want. Um, which maybe I shouldn't say. <laughs> so once they tweaked it, they got more combat and pugnaciousness, which makes the movies fun to watch. So this is using that same approach. So we're going to have people that live on the coast who are agents, and they're going to have these parameters that, that help them make decisions. And there's going to be variability amongst them. You know, we're going to draw from distributions that are the heterogeneous people. Um, we're going to look at houses as having an asset price, but also a rental flow, which is, you know, the value of being... Uh, in the, in the property, we use this approach called user cost of housing, where we're trying to understand what is the difference between the asset price and the rental flow. As you know, interest, property taxes, income tax, deduction, depreciation, all of those things matter for owning, not for renting. So we, we create this wedge between rent and sales prices. And we have two types of agents, again, building on some of that previous research. We have owner occupiers slash renters, and we have outside investors. Um, two types of property, oceanfront versus not. And what we're going to do is each period, we're going to, um, people are going to have values for, for housing. We're going to sort them and figure out who buys and who doesn't buy. So maybe some people move out. They're also going to vote on dune, uh, beach and dune replenishment every 10 years. And they're going to finance it locally, at least some of it. So it's, it's a lot of complex stuff going on. But basically, we're trying to create a little micro coastal economy and see what happens with our coastal economy. So the setup. Um, it's, it's supposed to look like old Nags Head before it was nourished. We've got uh, beach, dunes, oceanfront, houses, non oceanfront. All these parameters figure into how the model runs. So, just to give you a sense of what's behind um, under the hood. So, we're going to burn in for 50 years. We're going to try to make it look like the current economy of Nags Head for 50 years. So, I've got oceanfront home values, non oceanfront. Nothing's changing. And then I'm going to let sea level rise start to happen. The beach width is uh, being nourished. It's roughly constant. There's a little fluctuation. There's an investor share of housing, which is set up to look like um, Nags Head for the non-ocean front and ocean front. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, the, the, really complicated. Everybody in the model is trying to understand what they think the future, the future beach width is gonna look like, but they're using the past to predict it. So Dylan talked this morning about backward looking uh, expectations. That's what that is. Mm -hmm. um, we have an expected rate of return on these assets. We also have an outside market. So there's a, a bunch of stuff going on here, but we're gonna turn on sea level rise uh, in year 50 and let it go one meter to 150. So I, I think you can see why this is useful, right? Because we have no idea what this is gonna look like. Mm -hmm. and, and once we get it set up, we can start poking it, turning levers and kind of see, seeing how, how things change. So when we turn on sea level rise, uh, in the in the baseline, a couple of things happen. Um, once sea level starts rising, property values start going down. Initially, there's still a wedge between being on the ocean front and not, but eventually it disappears and disappears. The investors eventually get out. Again, they're the ones that are pricing the risk. They eventually get out, and we just have owner occupied. Um, those owner occupied are high marginal tax people. So basically, we have a lot of wealthy people buying the houses and moving to the coast. Uh, eventually, the risks get priced in. Um, so that's kind of our baseline to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Values are going down, and you can see they're getting they're getting close to zero after uh, 100 years of sea rise. Because they value it so much, so we have a bunch of nourishment going on to keep it constant. Oh, and we have a 90 percent subsidy, which I thought was too they high. They move out, or they, or, or they decide to leave, or they. They're, 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 they're moving in, their property values are going down, but they're still there. Basically, uh, the houses that remain are being purchased by people with, with the means to purchase them. The, the you know, outside investors get out uh, and they're fully priced in. So that's what's decreasing the property value. Um, the reason the beach nourishment stays the same is because of the subsidy. I should make but that can clear. you nourish your way out of sea level rise? That sounds like yeah. Yes, yeah. So 
in this one, in a, at one meter for this setting is, 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 we're not there yet. We're not being, we're not being completely inundated, but you're right. Okay. If, if we went a little bit further, yeah, okay. things are going to start to get. Can you clarify outside market values? Outside yeah, market. yeah. Okay. So the two things we're going to tweak are the subsidy for nourishment and the outside market. So the, 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 um, the investors are looking at all properties in the landscape as potential purchases. So in order for us to understand how the coastal values um, are going to change relative to other assets, we have like mountain lake homes that are the outside investment that we think are more uh, sound, under sea level rise. So that's the outside market. So these guys, when sea level starts rising, that's where they go. They start buying other properties. So we get this dynamic. And again, like I said, there's lots of ways we can tweak this. Two minutes? Okay. There's lots of ways we can tweak this and uh, get different kinds of outcomes. Um, again, this is just one of them. So I'll show you two, in my last two minutes, I'll show you two uh, tweaks. What if we increase the uh, subsidy? Now we get a lot of action. The beach width is fluctuating quite a bit. Oh, and this is changes relative to the baseline. It makes it a little bit uh, hard to understand. So what are the relative uh, dynamics here? So we get, um, as the beach decays, oceanfront houses go down, but when they nourish, they come back up. So we've got this fluctuation in values. Um, the investors eventually do drop out. We do have some changes in, in wealth, but eventually it's just wealthy people who are there. Um, so that's one, and I can come back to this afterwards if people want to ask more questions. <laughs> the, job chart finish up. the last thing we can do is let the outside market values appreciate. So if people start looking at houses in other parts of the country as better investments, um, we get some interesting dynamics. Um, the, let's see. Baseline. Um, oceanfront drops out first. Uh, Non-oceanfront will come back, and again, that's I guess wealthy people moving in. If I recall how to interpret this, um, we get some weird changes in beach width. Uh, the investors eventually move out. Um, yeah, that's not as interesting as the previous one. Let me. Uh, I'll come back. I'll come back. I'll come back if anybody wants to see more of that. I have to talk about it. Yeah. So last slide, um, cohabitation with nature could be hard. Um, all of these things are really important, as you know, and the way they interact, as I think you saw, like those are, they're so complicated, sometimes I forget the story behind them. Because you can say, why does that happen? And you have to think back, what could be driving that? So the, the uh, coupled human natural system is, is really uh, complicated to try to understand how that evolves. It can be really difficult. Two, two ideas I want to leave you with is path dependency. If we get on a certain path, it can make things worse. So we want to be uh, adaptable. Um, and given that there's going to be certain outcomes that we can't get away from, how do we get to where we're going to end up in the least possible cost way? So how can we be cost effective in coastal management? Uh, I think it's a really important question. That's Hurricane Floyd. It's a pretty picture. <laughs> So one or two questions before we, we ask the audience if anybody has some follow up questions. Okay. Not a good question. I like, I like asking questions. I do too. I think it's good to clarify. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, you have a question? You know, that last graph you did, it was 50 years and then the end of that was 100, correct? Yeah. So it went 50 and then went 100 more. So the end was 150. Thank you. You're trying to get your time frame down. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So, hypothetically, if you own a place, typically <laughs> four million dollars, a few little islands that you need to get to, and then a lot of quirky people on it, uh, what would you suggest for that island do to protect their investment? Just let's just say. Ooh, look at the time. <laughs> My alarm just went off. Wow. It's a tough, it's a really tough question. I mean, that's what we're trying to figure out. I don't think we have an easy answer. Um, I think cutting down the forest is the worst thing you can do. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's going to stabilize, you know, all those roots going to the sand. I mean, this is probably one of the more stable. And again, I'm not a geologist, but to me, it looks like it's really stable. Um, so I think that's good. Dan, you have a question? Yes. Uh, when you looked at all this, I assume there's different more fun. Morphology of that we're kind of a dynamic. Uh -huh. I don't hear we're moving around a lot. Sure. How would you say that impacts 
Like, those results? Yeah. Um, yeah, you're unique because you've got beaches on three sides. Our model is Nags Head, but you have one beach on one side. So I don't, I, it'd be hard to say. Really, you could probably think about this as East Beach, although it's not eroding too bad. So I don't know, maybe it's more like South Beach. Yeah. Those variables. I wouldn't, I mean, I'd probably need Marty and Dylan to help me understand how this. Island. But the thing is, all the variables are the same. They're just different. They change. Some of them change differently in time. Some of them change differently in space. Right. The key is you need to know what all the variables are to have the yeah. ability. Right. So take yeah. the model variables. At least you know what the variables you're supposed to be looking at, then apply them to other places, and that's when yeah. you know you, you can make better decisions about it. And that's that's the key is though you have to identify what all the variables are because without that you're in trouble. Because one might be important you haven't even thought about. It. And you have to be realistic. You know, a lot of people don't want to hear about income equality, but I think it is driving prices. Cool. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.